tonight. Decision day. India awaits the results of their mammoth election, with Modi set to clinch a rare third term in power. The opposition, however, faring better than expected to. Road to freedom. Pakistan's Imran Khan is acquitted of his charges of leaking state secrets, but jail time continues for the former Prime Minister on other charges. Biden's battles. The campaign trail heats up and the Democratic camp faces Hunter Biden's trial kickoff amid close poll numbers. And returning home. China's Chang'e 6 has a smooth sailing journey to the moon and now begins its descent to Earth. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. There are a lot of fresh updates on key stories from across the globe that we have to get you up to speed on. From new developments on the campaign trail in the US to the more regional stories like Imran Khan's acquittal. But of course, we have no better place to kick off this bulletin with updates on India's elections. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi is all set to clinch a rare third consecutive term when results from the world's biggest election are to be confirmed today. But Modi declared aim to win a 400-seat supermajority in the 543-seat lower house of parliament looks at risk. His Bharatiya Janata Party is comfortably leading in preliminary results, but the opposition Congress party is performing better than some analysts expected, putting his goals at risk. Preliminary results suggest that incumbent Prime Minister Narendra Modi will win the election, but he will not enjoy the landslide he has in previous elections. Modi being forced to form a new coalition would be uncharted territory in India's politics after a decade where he dominated politics. In India, Modi has cult-like status and today's early results show people are not supporting him as much as they may have before. Congress party leader Rahul Gandhi did not outright reject the possibility of his India alliance forming a government. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi mediated inside an island shrine for two days to cap weeks of election campaigning, his latest public display of religiosity days after proclaiming he was sent by God. And still in the region, former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan has been acquitted of leaking state secrets, but will remain in jail because of a conviction in another case. In the run-up to the elections in February, the 71-year-old, who was ousted as Prime Minister in 2022, was hit with three prison sentences for cases he insists were politically motivated. Pakistan former Prime Minister Imran Khan has been acquitted of charges of leaking state secrets by a high court. That's according to his lawyer and his party on Monday. Khan will remain in prison for now due to a conviction in another case. Khan had been sentenced to 10 years in prison by a lower court on charges of making public a classified cable sent to Islamabad by Pakistan's ambassador to Washington in 2022. He has been in jail since August last year. He had challenged the conviction in Islamabad High Court. It's set in an order on Monday that an instant appeal is allowed. Shah Mahmood Karashi, Khan's foreign minister during his tenure from 2018 to 2022, was also acquitted of the charges. It is seen as a major victory for the jailed former leader, Alima Khan is his sister. It was such an embarrassing case for Pakistan, and I'm really glad that the judi judiciary sort of... Um, came to a conclusion and they buried the charges and uh, declared the ex-Prime Minister and the ex-Foreign Minister innocent. Khan has been at odds with the country's powerful military, accusing it of targeting him and his party. The military denies this and has called for Khan and his supporters to be tried for attacking state installations during violent protests against Khan's initial arrest last year. The government said prosecutors were awaiting the detailed decision before deciding if they would appeal against the acquittal in the Supreme Court. 
Meanwhile, over in China, we see a tense situation as the foreign ministry opposes anyone using the Tiananmen Square political turmoil in the 1980s as a pretext to attack or smear the nation. In response to a question on Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong's comments on the protest and crackdown 35 years ago and their appeals over China's press freedom, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said a clear conclusion on the political turmoil has been long reached and that China opposes any country interfering in its internal affairs. Wong highlighted the brutal force used against student protesters and said her country remained concerned about China's ongoing restrictions on individual rights. On June 4, 1989, Chinese tanks rolled into Tiananmen Square before dawn to end weeks of student and work protests. June 4 is still a taboo topic in China as the ruling Communist Party has never released a death toll, though rights groups and witnesses say the figure could run into the thousands. Still in China, the space progress is smooth sailing for now. China's National Space Agency announced that the Chang'e 6 probe took off from the far side of the moon, starting its journey back towards Earth. The probe successfully completed its sample to collection and will now return to Earth. The probe's successful departure from the moon means China is closer to becoming the first country to return samples from far side of the moon, which permanently faces away from Earth. The probe, which departed the moon at 7.38 a.m. Beijing time, successfully completed its sample collection. The return of the lunar samples to Earth is being followed by scientists around the world who hope the soil collected by Chang'e 6 can help answer questions about the origins of the solar system. And over in Iran now, registration for Iran's 14th presidential election concluded at the Interior Ministry in the Iranian capital, Tehran, with 80 candidates entering the race for the country's top executive position following the unfortunate demise of former President Ibrahim Raisi. Registered candidates include Iran's Parliament Speaker Mohammad Bakay Kalibaf, Culture Minister Mohammad Mehdi Ismaili, former President Mohammad Ahmadinejad, former First Vice President Eshak Jahangiri, former Parliament Speaker Ali Larijani and former Chief Nuclear Negotiator Saeed Jaliri. The five-day registration process kicked off on Thursday. Iran's Guardian Council of Constitution will determine the list of qualified candidates in the coming days. The election is scheduled to take place on the 28th of June. The 14th presidential election, originally scheduled for 2025, was brought forward due to the unexpected death of President Ibrahim Raisi in a helicopter crash on the 19th of May in the northwestern province of East Azerbaijan. <laughs> We're going in for a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have updates now on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has told U.S. President Joe Biden that the outline of an Israeli peace proposal he announced was not the full plan. Under pressure from ministers in his coalition government, Netanyahu told his critics there would be no peace until Hamas is destroyed. Facing strong opposition from far-right members of his coalition to a new Gaza ceasefire proposal, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Monday that a plan announced by U.S. President Joe Biden on Friday was only a partial outline of Israel's proposal. President Biden said Israel had proposed a three-phase plan that includes a partial and then complete release of hostages as well as a phased withdrawal of Israeli troops. However, Netanyahu emphasized that the war would continue until Hamas is eliminated. We are working in countless ways to return our hostages. We have gone the extra mile to bring them back. But during this action, we have maintained the goals of the war and primarily the elimination of Hamas. In response to Biden's announcement, Israel's Minister of Finance and a National Security Minister threatened to resign and topple Netanyahu's coalition government if he went ahead with the plan. The U.S. State Department countered increasing Israeli criticism of Biden's remarks by stating that the plan was ultimately an Israeli proposal. It was an Israeli proposal. Obviously, it was a proposal that they developed in consultation with the United States and Qatar and Egypt, the three countries that have played the mediating role throughout this process, but this was ultimately an Israeli proposal. According to the White House, during a phone call with Qatar's emir on Monday, Biden affirmed that Hamas is the only obstacle to a complete ceasefire and confirmed Israel's readiness to move forward with terms he set out last week. 
In a joint statement on Monday, G7 leaders said they stood behind the proposal and called on Hamas to accept it. On the same day, the South Korean government announced its full support for the peace proposal, urging all related parties to promptly accept and faithfully implement it. And on the road to the White House tonight, some tensions over in the Democratic camp. U.S. President Joe Biden boarded the Air Force One to attend a private campaign event in Connecticut, the day a jury was sworn in for his son Hunter Biden's criminal trial. The president's son is accused of failing to disclose his use of illegal drugs when he bought a Colt Cobra 38 caliber revolver and of illegally possessing the weapon for 11 days in October of 2018. Hunter Biden has pleaded not guilty to three felony charges. President Biden attended a closed-door fundraise in Greenwich, Connecticut, where he first called former President Donald Trump a convicted felon to a small group of donors. Biden did not comment on his son's legal troubles. He had issued a statement earlier in the day saying that a lot of families have loved ones who have overcome addiction. Opening statements are happening today after a jury was seated yesterday. Twelve jurors and four alternates were chosen from a pool of 60 potential jurors yesterday. The Kremlin described allegations by Microsoft that Russia has stepped up an online disinformation campaign taking aim at France and the upcoming Paris Olympics as absolute slander. Paris gearing up for this summer's Olympics. Two reports warn of Russian disinformation targeting the Games, including fake videos aimed at spreading fear of violence and damaging the reputation of the Olympics. Produced, a Microsoft report says, by prolific Russian influence actors. This bogus documentary, posted last summer, titled Olympics Has Fallen, featured a deep fake Tom Cruise, while a second report, published tomorrow by US cyber experts Recorded Futures, says Russia is the most likely primary state actor to target the Olympics with a disruptive cyber attack. President Putin furious with France for its support of President Zelensky and Putin angry at the IOC for banning athletes from competing under the Russian flag because of the war. Paris has invested billions to beef up security, facing challenges, one of the reports says, not seen since London 2012, from protests to cyber attacks. Warning cyber criminals will be attracted to such high profile events and the chance to target the public with email phishing scams and suspicious links. Meanwhile, over in Europe, the unrest continues. Spanish farmers blocked a highway at the border of France and Spain just days before the bloc's residents vote in the European Parliament elections. Just a few days before the European election, farmer protests caused yet again traffic chaos in the continent. In a coordinated effort, around 100 tractors have been blocking the border between Spain and France. They obstructed seven main crossing points stretching from the Basque region to Catalonia. Authorities have announced major disruptions and encouraged drivers to postpone their trip or to use another mean of transport. Protests have been rocking Europe for months. Farmers are rallying against the rising cost of energy as well as calling for greater food safety for products entering Europe. They also asked EU lawmakers to implement a European law favoring local products. There are weather woes today as well. The temperatures in California and the western United States are set to soar this week as a scorching heat dome settles over the region. This is expected to bring heightened fire danger. A new threat for the west, scorching heat. 475 firefighters already battling California's first major wildfire of the year. The dry grass quickly going up near the town of Tracy. The Corral Fire incinerating more than 20 square miles east of San Francisco in the last 48 hours. Two firefighters sustaining burns when the erratic winds change direction expected to be okay. The start of the fire not far from the explosives testing facility belonging to the famed Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Authorities warning that fire season is now a year-round event. 
And while there are blazes in the U.S., Brazil is struggling to stay afloat. A study has shown the unusually intense, prolonged and extensive flooding that has devastated southern Brazil was made at least twice as likely by human burning of fossil fuels and trees. Scientists say climate change doubled the likelihood of the recent flooding in southern Brazil, with the El Nino phenomenon also intensifying the heavy rains. Authorities called it the worst disaster in the region's history after storms and floods hit the southern state of Rio Grande do Sul last month, killing more than 170 people and displacing nearly 580,000. Experts from the World Weather Attribution Group said the heavy rainfall in southern Brazil was an extremely rare event and would have been even less likely without fossil fuel-driven climate change. Lincoln Alves is with Brazil's National Institute for Space Research. These discoveries are coherent with what we have been observing, a weather with more heat. El Nino, which raises temperatures globally and increases rainfall and flood risk in parts of the Americas, also contributed to the recent disaster by making it more likely and the rains more intense. Regina Rodriguez is another member of the research team. So this pattern is consistent with the typical El Nino influence over South America. However, studies have show that climate change will intensify this pattern. As a consequence, the high pressure center over central Brazil is becoming larger and more persistent, pushing warmer air that holds more moist further south. Regina stressed the importance of maintaining flood infrastructure and urban planning to reduce the impact of such extreme events. The researchers say deforestation and Brazil's rapid urbanization were other factors, with both amplifying the impact of the floods. Nigeria's main labor unions have embarked on an indefinite strike after talks over a new minimum wage meant to cushion the impact of economic reforms collapsed. Nigeria's main labor unions shut down the national grid and disrupted airline operations across the country on Monday. This was the start of an indefinite strike over the government's failure to agree a new minimum wage. This is the fourth strike by the Nigerian Labour Congress and the Trade Union Congress, two of Nigeria's biggest unions since President Bola Tanubu took office last year. State-owned utility, the Transmission Company of Nigeria, said union members drove away operators at the country's power control rooms and shut down at least six substations. That eventually shut down the national grid in the early hours of the morning. Two airlines said the strike had grounded flights. Since taking office, Tanubu has embarked on a series of bold economic reforms. That's fueled a rise in inflation to an almost 30-year high and worsened a cost-of-living crisis. Unions declared the indefinite strike on Friday after the collapse of talks for a new minimum wage, meant to cushion the impact of reforms. The union said the strike would last until a new minimum wage was put in place. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. And to wrap up our rundown tonight, we have some updates on the ongoing T20 World Cup matches. Afghanistan produced a dominant bowling and batting performance to thrash debutants Uganda by 125 runs in their T20 World Cup opening game in Guanya. And as we speak, we have England facing off against Scotland in a familiar matchup dating back decades. Here are some updates on that match. Rain has delayed the start of the match. Scotland cricket team captain Rishi Barrington won the toss and opted to bat against England. Mark Wood takes the ball for England and finds some late in-swing immediately, but George Monsey finds his range. Defending champions England take on Scotland in a crucial Group B encounter in the T20 World Cup 2024. The Jos Butler-led side are in good form after defeating Pakistan in a T20I series just ahead of the competition. This match holds a lot of significance in a group that comprises of Oman, Namibia and Australia. 
The early morning match was also one of importance. Uganda were the second team to qualify from the ICC T20 World Cup Africa qualifiers after Namibia and pipped the likes of Zimbabwe and Namibia to make their way to the tournament. Led by Brian Masaba, the team features Frank Nusmuga, who will be among the oldest players to feature in the competition at the age of 43. Afghanistan, on the other hand, had come into the tournament as dark horses, having defeated the likes of England, Pakistan and Sri Lanka at last year's ODI World Cup in India. Globetrotting T20 spin sensation Rashid Khan will take over as skipper after Ibrahim Zadran led the side in their previous ICC tournament. And that wraps up all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Stay tuned as Sinamaya Dine will join you in just a moment with a nightly business report. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.